Hi, everybody. Stefan Molyneux. I hope you're doing well. Here with Simon Roche. He is the head of the office of the HQ of the world's largest non-state civil defense organization, Landers of South Africa. He was once an African National Congress activist, but he is now he now works with the Soitlanders to prepare for impending catastrophe, I assume catastrophes, in the Rainbow Nation, the website is Soitlanders, that's S-U-I-D-L-A-N-D-E-R-S dot org, and you can follow Simon, twitter.com forward slash, forward slash Soitlanders. We will put the links to all of that below. Simon, thank you so much for taking the time today. Thank you very much for having us, Stefan. We need all the support we can get at this difficult, darkening time. So what has changed in particular since the last time we talked that has everybody very concerned? I suppose it began on Monday, the 30th of October, when a nationwide protest called Black Monday was undertaken uh, against farm murders, particularly. And that was uh, the third occasion on which conservatives had really stood together against the kind of mad liberal values that are sweeping the world with South Africa in the vanguard of that. The previous occasion was when a uh, a very large um, boycott was undertaken against a, a restaurant that handled a racial incident very badly. And all of a sudden, this restaurant lost its core market to the point that the price of potatoes in South Africa dropped so badly that farmers, many farmers, uh, stopped planting potatoes and chose other crops. Potatoes for French fries in this nationwide restaurant chain whose core target market is very conservative, middle class, uh, largely white. The second incident was when a radio station was boycotted. And uh, lastly, we have this Black Monday. And three days later, the Minister of Defense conducted an interview in which he said, if whites do such a thing again, I should point out that it was a peaceful protest. No women were raped. Uh, no buses were stoned, uh, no municipal buildings burned to the ground, and so on and so forth. Peaceful across the country. If whites do such a thing again, they are going to cause a civil war and they are going to bring a genocide upon themselves. And that was the first occasion on which the, a government, a senior government minister, spoke about this kind of thing in a in a non-reticent way. I mean, earlier in the year, we'd had an instance where the head of the ANC's armed wing made a nationwide call for black, young blacks to join training camps to learn to fight whites in a civil war. But it's not quite the same thing as the Minister of Defense promising a civil war and a genocide. And since then, there's been kind of a uh, underlying tension. Then we had the elections of the... Uh, uh, African National Congress, their leadership elections, and that was very, very fraught with tension and acrimony. It was it was a toxic process. And the new chap was elected, and a few days later, he, this guy is perceived by many people to be what is known in South Africa as a coconut, brown on the outside but white on the inside, you know, um, and that he's a friend of the whites and he's a great guy. And at Nelson Mandela's funeral, somebody said to me, you know, you whites have got it all wrong with this guy. His name is Cyril Ramaphosa. He's an ANC dog on an ANC leash, and you're going to learn that the hard way. Lo and behold, he gets elected, and he says, we're going to take white land without compensation. There have been a few things since then, but I think that's, in a, in a nutshell, what's, what's happened recently. So, I mean, I'm appalled not only at what happened, Simon, but at the lack of media attention around the world. I suppose I shouldn't be surprised, but I still retain the capacity to be shocked by the complicity of the media in the in the tensions in South Africa. So the whites got together uh, to protest uh, peacefully to exercise freedom of association, freedom of assembly, freedom of speech. And they were warned by the government that if they did it again, they as a race, whites as a race, would be wiped from, from the face of South Africa. Yeah, that's right. And in fact, it wasn't only the government, the leading far left party, uh, which is an offshoot, kind of an offshoot, very Marxist, of the ANC, um, their leader stood up and said <laughs> that if whites protest again like this, we are going to engage them by main force. 
we, it's it's going to be you know a series of conflicts across the country. Wherever they gather, our people are going to go, and we are going to fight them. And he spoke at length about you know fighting, about uh, you know toe to toe, man to man, uh, people smashing one another up. So that's the kind of tone of things at the moment. Now this gathering together, what specifically were the whites protesting in these in these gatherings? Well, mostly farm murders. Uh, to put it into perspective for you, uh, Stefan, I have a, a, a house uh, domestic worker, and um, she's she's black. And she and I were chatting the other day. She's a first class woman, and uh, I was talking to her about uh, certain rapes and murders that have happened recently. And she kept on saying to me, "I just cannot believe that we know nothing about this." And uh, her sister came along to visit her, to visit her, to have lunch, you know, with us. And um, we chatted some more about it. And her sister, her twin sister was saying, you know, also, I, I don't know anything about this. I can't believe it. Are you honestly telling me that three-year-old girls are being raped? People are being trussed up and put in their trucks, you know, their Ford trucks, and then having the trucks set on fire on these farms around the country. And we, we know nothing about it. The government is keeping this from us. So I think that gives you some sort of idea. Right. Well, let, let's talk a little bit about these murders. Uh, of course, um, it is the most dangerous job in the world, being a farmer in South Africa. It's worse than being a police uh, in, in a ghetto or anything like that. And where they are reported, of course, Simon, they are camouflaged as yes. robberies. But this yes. functionally cannot be the case. I mean, as uh, Dr. Mulder pointed out uh, in a video, you don't sit around for five hours waiting for a family to come home and then torture and murder them most brutally and rape and so on. If you're just there to steal, if no one's there and you go in, uh, then you steal yeah. and you leave. But this lying in wait and preying upon, it is a fundamentally political action. It is uh, an act of political terrorism designed to drive the farm owners from their land uh, for ideological purposes. That's absolutely correct, and and very few people get it, and it's difficult for us to convey this to people. But, um, you know, Dr. Gregory Stanton of Genocide Watch in Washington, D.C., has spoken about this from time to time and described how it's a classic Marxist tactic. And, you know, it's, it's sad that we have to depend upon liberals, because he is a liberal, um, to explain Marxist tactics, because if conservatives try to explain this to people, you sound like, or, or in their minds, you are... A baddie who just wants to attribute negative, deleterious things to your poor opponents. Uh, but, you know, the, the examples are legion. We belong to various WhatsApp groups. And so we get a running commentary on the murders every day, particularly on the what we call small holdings, the small farms that, that are not in any way commercial, on the peripheries of the big cities. And, um, yeah, it's, it's an ongoing thing where... You know, somebody will send a report saying nothing has been stolen, uh, cell phone is here, car is here, keys are here, money is here, safe is still here, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very often done for fun or, um, as Dr. Gregory Stanton has hinted darkly, most notably in 2012, um, at the behest of a third force. At the behest of a third force. Is that uh, something we can unpack in this conversation? Yeah, yeah certainly. It's it's core, really, I, I, I think, Stefan. <clears throat> so the third force would be the sort of Marxist political motivations, uh, which is similar to, of course, what happened in Cambodia with the killing fields. It's similar to what happened uh, uh, under the uh, Marxist-Leninists in Russia uh, with the Kulaks and so on. It is, of course, the idea that uh, the land has been stolen, that all of the people who are better off than you are are only wealthy because they've stolen from you, and therefore it is a form of class-based self-defense to initiate violence against your oppressors, uh, of course, who are doing the ungodly crime, are feeding you. That's it. That's, that's absolutely what it is. And many people will say that this is the what is known in South Africa as the incomplete national democratic revolution continuing, which is to say that at the heart of ANC policy, the African National Congress, our ruling party, our government party of government, 
has a uh, policy known as the National Democratic Revolution, which was composed largely by a uh, communist by the name of Joe Slovo, a Lithuanian uh, immigrant. And um, indeed, much of the ANC's entire corpus was composed, incidentally, by Lithuanian immigrants. Uh, even their Freedom Charter document was written by three Lithuanian immigrants. Um, <clears throat> The point being that this national democratic revolution is communism in its purest form. And we believe that really what's happening here is that the producing classes are being eroded from the periphery or corroded, um, like, like a blanket phrase from the outside, um, to the point where they can't hold their own. You know, people are being chased off the land. I'll illustrate it this way. Um, I'm not sure of the exact number of farms in South Africa. Prior to this interview, I did some research and couldn't get a, a, a reliable figure. It varies from about 60,000 farms to about 100,000 farms. It's a matter of fact that about 21,000 of those farms are now for sale. There's been a, a steep incline, which goes exactly to what you were talking about. And... As an aside, slightly as an aside, but there is some kind of reflected relevance to it. The government has until now had a policy of a willing buyer, willing seller, buying up farms against which there are farm claims, historical farm claims. Stefan Molyneux's dad knocked my dad over the head and stole his piece of land and, and um, I want it back. Of those, 92.7% of the successful claims are never taken up. They opt for the money instead. So it's all about we need the land, we're close to the soil, our forefathers, oh dear Lord, dear Lord. You know, it's a kind of histrionic appeal to the guilt of the West, in a sense, and to Western values. Um, terribly histrionic, but the moment that the rubber hits the road, there's an immediate change of tune. And so about 92.7% of all successful farm claims um, the option is never exercised and they, they go for the bucks instead. Now, of the successful farm claims where the option was exercised, 4,323 of those farms have never been occupied. And the head of the body, the, the head of the body responsible was interviewed the other day and she said in a very almost uh, colloquial you know, manner, very casual, offhand, informally. She basically clicked her tongue, uh, which is a, uh, uh, implies dismissiveness in, in black African culture in South Africa, uh, clicked her tongue and said, well, the problem is that the, the moment that the claims are successful and these people have, are given the land, she said the fighting begins in between and counterclaims happen so we can't award it to the, the 20 or 30 or 100 uh, clansmen whose forefathers occupied that piece of land because actually they all begin saying the moment that they win, well, actually, the Molyneux family were latecomers. And, and in fact, they shouldn't have a share in this. So it's, it's all nonsense. The whole thing is a fiction from beginning to end. Well, of course, it's designed to operate against or to undermine the rule of law and of private property and of contract. And there's this constant Marxist, you throw endless numbers of spanners into the machinery. And then when the machine breaks, you say, well, it was never going to work to begin with. I mean, so they continue to undermine the functional contracts and ownership rights that make the free market function. And then they say, ah, you see, capitalism is doomed by its very nature. Well, of course, if you sabotage something, it's easy to say that it's breaking for some outside cause, but it's, you know, your hand that's covered in, in blood and, and axle grease. Yes, absolutely right. A, a similar thing, um, Stefan, is that about, I don't recall the exact date, but about seven or eight months ago, Two white farm managers apprehended a black guy stealing copper cable on the farm. It's a very big thing in South Africa. It's part of the reason why our electricity is unreliable. Uh, thieves steal copper cable. They sell it to, 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 to scrapyards and so on, and they make a bit of bucks that way. 
And um, so they apprehended this guy, didn't beat him up, didn't rape him, didn't set dogs on him, didn't shoot him. They, they put him inside a coffin and they did not, this is the, the crucial thing, they did not close the lid. The lid was in two parts, the lower section from the uh, 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 thorax downwards uh, was closed. The upper section covering the head wasn't closed. And they kind of threatened to close it. And he had his arm out of the coffin, say, oh, please don't close it. And they, they put that lid section over his arm and they kind of pretended to close it. It went on for about, I don't know, 10, 15 seconds, that, that part. And once they traumatized him enough, they, you know, said, all right, buzz off. This, one of the chaps took a video of it, it went viral, the government got hold of it. These guys were eventually sentenced to, if I recall correctly, 11 and 15 years. And during the entire drama, from every corner of the government, they were talking about this white racism and blah, 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 when clearly all it was is two guys trying to traumatize somebody so that he doesn't stop, uh, that he doesn't steal their cable so that their damn milking machines can work you know, not, the cows not have mastitis and so on. Um, well, it is, it is of course, rough and unpleasant frontier justice, so to speak. But wouldn't it be fair, Simon, to say that this kind of behavior arises out of frustration with the police force as a whole and the feeling that if you turn this guy over to the police, uh, nothing is going to happen? Well, that's exactly the thing. And the best comparison to make is with the, whatever rapes and murders happened around that time. And there were a number of them. You hear no such opprobrium from the government. You know, they, they want to focus on the injustice and how bad the producer classes are. Um, and it's completely fictional. And then they ensure that the national broadcaster doesn't talk about all of the other more brutal incidents that happened around about the same time. But yes, if the police were reliable and dependable, then of course, that's what everybody would do at once. Who wouldn't? This, uh, I mean, this cover-up of, of criminality is, it's not just exclusive to South Africa, of course. It, it is an unbelievable cone of silence around this stuff, which is harmful to blacks, it's harmful to whites, it's harmful to our even potential capacity to get along, and it is sowing the verbal seeds of divisiveness that can, can easily erupt into more widespread violence. It's unbelievable. Yeah. It's absolutely unbelievable. Now, let's talk a little bit about the history, of course. I know we touched on this last time, but uh, I was very struck by the interview you sent me with Dr. Mulder, who said, he said, listen, my people have been in South Africa for 333 years, which is longer than almost all whites uh, can trace back to America. In other words, they're more firmly ensconced into the South African soil than whites are in America. And... The collision point seems to be, uh, correct me if I've gone astray here, but the collision point seems to be that if the South African government attempts to take this land by force, then the white farmers, the, the whites, uh, the Boers, are not going to allow this to happen peacefully. And this is where the fundamental collision point may be and the spark that could ignite a civil war. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's, there's very little more to embroider on what you've just said. The hardcore reality is that many people are fed up and sick and tired. And they're at the point where they're not willing to back down again because it's the fashionable thing to do, because sociologists say that it's the thing to do, because newspapers overseas tell us that we're bad thing to do. People are incensed by what's going on, by the degree and the extent of the rape and the murder and the, uh, the stock theft and everything else, the, 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 the prejudicial black economic empowerment, uh, read uh, uh, affirmative action laws and so on and so forth. And it's at that point where, where many reliable, dependable people, non-bullshitters, if I may use that word, are putting their foot down and saying, I will, I'll be the first, I'll fire a shot, but over my dead body, Am I going to leave a farm that my family occupied for eight generations on a piece of land that the London Missionary Society declared uh, um, uh, uh, unoccupied in reports 250 years ago? I'll shoot first. Well, and I think there is also, now that we have enough 
vision down the bloody tunnel of time that Marxism leads to, looking at the 20th century alone, where it's slaughtered uh, upwards of 100 million people, I think it's fairly clear to everyone where this leads. It's not going to end with being kicked off your land. It's not going to end with being thrown into a squatter camp. It is going to end, I believe, with what was promised by a senior member of the South African government, which is genocide. And is it better to fight against that sooner or later? Uh, Of course, I'm not on the ground. It's not for me to make that decision, but I can certainly see the case. Yeah. You know, we, Saitlanders, speaking as a civil defense organization, bend over backwards to uh, adhere to or obey uh, international law and South African law. In fact, we're very, very strict about unlicensed firearms and all of this kind of stuff so that we can keep the moral high ground right to the, the very last minute. Um, the, the, the key thing to keeping the moral high ground is that you are able to hopefully enjoin the world to see your side of the story. Now, I'm going to contradict myself in a second here when I say that we don't believe that we're going to get much support from the world because it would be one of the most humiliating about turns in history, I think, if CNN, ABC, NBC, CBS, all of these prostitutes were to now begin saying, oh, dear me, we were wrong all along. Oh, gracious. You know, um, this rainbow nation and what have you is is a fiction. We said it was going to be an idol, a a kind of Elysium, but actually it's not. Um, So we don't think we're going to get much support, but what little bit of support we can get, we have to bet on every single day. So we're bending over backwards, but to go to your point of whether it'll happen sooner or later, it's hard to tell. But there are a couple of things in the offing at the moment that have us on our toes. And I mentioned to you earlier on that I've got a, you know, my kitchen is in a bit of a state um, because it's full of preparations. We're, uh, I wouldn't say panic stricken, but one or two, two of us are. I count myself amongst them. But as an organization, we are making many last preparations because we now have a situation where union leaders are calling for a shutdown of the entire country, including certain strategic um, industries, which I won't mention here if you don't mind but we know that if some of those industries some of those spheres of the economy are to be shut down in the next few weeks we will be very very close to a crisis by main force and why is it that they are threatening to shut down these key industries what are they protesting Oh, they're protesting the fact that uh, our current national president, uh, I should point this out, how the the ANC works is that they elect their their president, the president of the African National Congress as a party, about 18 months prior to the next election in which they have to have a new president. So we have two terms like the USA, you elect your man about 18 months. Months before you let the previous chap serve out his time, you go into the elections. If you win the elections, your new chap becomes the national president. He's just been elected. His name is Cyril Ramaphosa, <clears throat> and his supporters are agitating for the the current president of the country not to serve out his term, but to be immediately replaced by. This, this new guy. Now, in all of the state of flux and agitation, the State of the Nation address should have happened today. Our State of the Nation address, kind of the beginning of the parliamentary year, and it was postponed just 48 hours prior. It was postponed on Tuesday, two days back, two days in advance of the event. And so there's a lot of... Um, the state of flux, a lot of ructions, people saying, well, if the president doesn't go, uh, then we're going to shut down the, the, uh, the, the country. And these are guys who've been true to their word before. So it's becoming more and more tense. Now, regarding some of the other, and this is a little bit more abstract, but to me, it's, it's sort of very important with regards to the economic future of South Mm. Africa that I have heard murmurings from the African, South African government regarding nationalization. Now, of course, when they start talking about taking 
eight generation owned land by force from owners without compensation. And the without compensation, I mean, if you're forced into a sale, uh, you may end up with some rapidly devaluating currency, but it is still a massive violation of property rights and uh, self-ownership. And so if they're going to start going around nationalizing and, and violating property rights of long standing or short standing for that matter, then they're going to complain, of course, that they're not getting enough investment. And the reason they're not getting enough investment is racism. And it's like, no, any yes. country that starts violating property rights in that egregious a manner is going to invite no sane investment of any kind. Because what's the point of building a factory if the Marxists are just going to swarm it like termites and take it over? Well, that's uh, that's what's going on at the moment to some, some degree. Our currency has been devaluated to near junk status. Our sovereign bond rate bonds ratings are at almost junk status. Some of our economy is rated at junk. Uh, there's been a scandal where it was uncovered that uh, our debt-ridden, very, very poorly managed uh, national electricity supplier, ESCOM, uh, took a five billion rand loan from uh, the Public Investment Corporation. In other words, all the, the government employees' pension fund and nobody knew about it. They've been downgraded again. So th this kind of thing, at a slight tangent, but not much of a tangent to what you're talking about, is occurring right now, where international investors say, guys, we don't play that way. That's not what we do with our money. That's not how you get rich and successful in life. But there is also a mentality which says it's better to have 10%, uh, oh, I beg your pardon, 100% of 10 than to have 10% of a billion. In other words, it's better to be the big fish in the pond, to have one center of power and to have no opponents, to be the big man, the big African man, as Africans call them, the big African man, the Bob Mugabe, the Kamuzu Hastings Banda, the Julius Nyerere, the Mobutu Sese Seko. Um, there, is, there is an element of that. There's no two ways about it, Stefan. You're right. Now, another thing that... I wanted to talk about is whether or not this could be framed to some degree as not necessarily black versus white, although that certainly is how it's manifesting. Given the demographics, it would almost be inevitable. But it is to some degree Marxism versus freedom, because there are black workers who are tortured and slaughtered on the white farms as well. And uh, yes. the blacks are discouraged from working with whites and blacks are targeted uh, by the Marxists uh, as well. And yes. to me, yes. of course, it has a lot. There is, of course, tribalism and there is race uh, issues mm -hmm. involved. But there is also something which is a little bit less discussed, which is I believe that the races can get along a lot better if there isn't this massive political power that everyone is trying to grab a hold of to benefit their tribe at the expense of someone else. I'm brought to mind of uh, Europe uh, during 300 years of religious warfare prior to the separation of church and state. Once we have state and race united and the races mm -hmm. which gain control of the state can use it to pillage the general mm -hmm. person and benefit their own tribal members while uh, mm -hmm. oppressing others. I wonder how much of this is pure race uh, hatred and how much of this is simply the inevitable effects of well, I mean, what did the um, what did the communists talk about in the 1920s? They said we're going to use the blacks uh, to create racial divisions to destabilize the free market and discredit uh, private property. And I wonder how much of it is race. There is definitely that, but how much of it uh, is this uh, undiscussed or undescribed rampant Marxism that is causing these conflicts? I think, speaking in my personal capacity only, that it is a um, it is a tribalist mentality riding the coattails of Marxism. Mm. Marxism is a tremendous vehicle for the guy who wants to be the premier of the USSR and have a Dasha in the woods. You, you know, it, it's a it's a fantastic vehicle. If you're the if you're the rider of the horse, if you're the driver of the of the wagon or whatever, um, if you're the man at the top of the pile, Marxism is a number one. Mm. Um, I think that, you know, our president, our current president, Jacob Zuma, he of the seven wives, said on the 6th of January 2015 at a banquet in Cape Town that uh, his words were all of South Africa's problems 
can be traced back to the arrival of whites in Cape Town on the 6th of April, 1652. And a, a, a black guy I know, a very successful, powerful, influential uh, politician said to me, you know what we hear when we hear that, Simon? In our idiom, we hear, if we got rid of you guys, everything would be all right. Um, so I think it's a combination of factors. I think that they're employing pure Marxism. They're employing the pure Marxism of the died in the wool communists, uh, the you know the Lithuanian immigrant stereotype, which we don't have now. I mean, that goes back 80, 90, 100 years. But that stereotype, they're employing that for their ends. This works well for me. Well, the reality, as as far as I see it, Simon, is is simply this: that the land was largely uninhabited uh, by people when the Europeans arrived, that there were, of course, the local uh, blacks who were pushed aside and, and killed rampantly uh, by the Bantus who came down from the north, and that mm -hmm. uh, the Europeans basically came into a largely uninhabited wilderness. The amount of human life that can be sustained by a natural environment prior to farming and technology and so on is actually extraordinarily low. And like, you really can't get many people uh, at all in a hunter-gatherer society. And this, is, of course, was, was pretty clear that it was very low inhabited. Now, what's happened, of course, as you know, is that European technology, European farming methods, European healthcare, European medicine uh, has allowed for a massive explosion in the population of South Africa and other places in Africa as well, not to mention things like uh, foreign aid and so on. And so there's, there's been the huge explosion in the population, largely as a result of Western technology and Western mm. money and Western medicine. Now, if that all goes, the infrastructure that is supporting that massive rise mm. in population, tens mm. and tens of millions mm. of people in South Africa alone, the um, foundation of the house called population will collapse. And when that happens, mm. the population itself will collapse. Well, what it will do is it will try and get to Europe, of course, uh, causing mm. ine inevitable problems there as well. And yes. this fundamental problem, uh, it's like the Malthusian lines uh, of um, human population growth versus food productivity, which has been sustained, will, um, in a sense, write themselves in the most horrible kinds of ways. And this is easily predictable to anybody who studied history and who understands population differences mm. and so on. And where, you know, where is, where are people talking about this? The The goal of keeping people on the farms is the goal of sustaining millions of lives of both whites and blacks. And how is it yes. possibly not horribly racist when blacks are going to suffer by far the most if farm production diminishes? How is it possibly racist to wish to retain property rights for the original owners? Well, I'd like to point out to you, uh, Stefan, that in 1950, a very important census was done in South Africa, a key census. And it was established that the black population was just over 5 million then. It had been closer to about 1 million uh, some 100 years before, give or take, um, which was the time that the blacks and the whites clashed. Uh, previously, it had been around about 3 million, but about two-thirds of the entire black population, I'm not talking about combatants, how many casualties there were in Napoleon's army and how many in uh, the, the, the Duke of Wellington's army and so on and so forth, which ranged between 15 and 20 percent. I'm talking about two-thirds of every man, woman and child were slaughtered in what is known as the Infitani, the, the, the powerful uh, civil wars, let's say, of the early 19th century in South Africa. By 1950, that had recovered to about 5 million people. By 1990, it was just over 40 million people. Yeah. That's an eight-fold increase. An eight-fold increase in 40 years. And in sociological, anthropological, and medicinal terms, a, a, a nominal generation is 25 years. So the average reproduction occurs at 25 years. Some people are having babies at the age of 11, God forbid. Some women at the age of 43, good for them. But the average scientific generation is 25 years. So in under two generations, the population expanded itself by 800%. That's not possible. It's not possible to have that much, with respect, sexual intercourse. You just can't do it. But it was done. It was done because of running water, clean running water, warm water, 
um, uh, hospitals, food, surplus income, so on and so forth, a, a, a strong police force. You know, the list is, is almost uh, endless. And I, I just really wanted to pass comment on that salient point that you'd make. Well, and this is, if you look at, if you imagine the graph, right? I mean, for 150,000 odd years, it's flatlined. There's no population growth. There's virtually no progress. There's no wheel. There's no written language. There's no two-story buildings. Uh, there's, there's no progress. And then, I mean, we could sort of argue when and how and so on. But if we just focus on this period, you see this flat line of the black population in South Africa. And then when uh, under apartheid, there is, a, as you say, an 800% increase in population a uh, massive increase in longevity, and of course, a huge reduction in infant mortality, which had a lot to do with, with all of this. Mm. And this is the time, mm. flatlined for 150,000 years. And then just 1950 to 1990, massive population explosion. And this is the time mm. of greatest oppression, according to the theory, in South African history. And of or course, statistically, history, it makes no sense at all. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, sorry, I beg your pardon. I just wanted to interject or in world history as they would have it. <laughs> right. And <laughs> and during this time, you know, where, where is, I don't know, giant asshole Peter Gabriel warbling about farm murders because he put so much attention on the Stephen Biko incident? Like, where are all of these musicians who just care mm -hmm. so much about oppression? Mm -hmm. Where are they talking about the one farm murder a day? where people are slaughtered yes. in their historical homes. Where is the outrage? Where yes. is the group? So, of course, they don't care because the white yes. hatred, the hatred of whites has become yes. a worldwide metastasized phenomenon where even when whites yes. are in the minority, even when their rights are being taken away, even when they're being murdered at will, there is no mm. sympathy whatsoever. And this is yeah, a worldwide phenomenon true. of which South Africa is the canary in the coal mine. We are the canary in the coal mine. We're in the vanguard of this, this social experiment. You know, uh, I don't want to begin to sound like, uh, wacky because we're very much feet on the ground people. We're dealing with reality. Um, but one can't help beginning to think of the conspiracy theories around Agenda 21. You know, when you see it playing out so um, in, in such a stereotypical manner, um, you know, stereotyped to the abstract theory that crazies like David Icke propounded 20 years ago. You begin to, well, maybe the crazy guy in the purple tracksuit was right and all the rest were wrong, you know? Well, I'll tell you this, of course, anybody who says that it is a wise strategy for a population explosion that relies on sound farming methods, that is a sound strategy to drive the most competent farmers off the land, everybody understands that that is going to result in radical Civil war and depopulation. And uh, yeah. the idea that anybody smart enough to make that case is not smart enough to figure out the consequences. No, no. They, they know yes. what they're doing. They know what they're doing. Yes. This is not accidental. Oh, they know what they do. Yeah. They now, they let's do. just have a, a little chat about Cape Town. Mm. Because the idea that the first major industrialized Western-style city is going to run out of water. Mm. What is going on over there? In 2002, a group of scientists submitted a document to the government in which they made a forecast of South African water usage development and where the greatest threats were. 2002, six, 16 years ago. Between 2002 and now, the government has done precisely zero. That's the long and the short of the story. It doesn't get more interesting, more fascinating than that. Um, there is a bit of finger pointing about whether it's, you know, the Western Cape a region of South Africa, the province called the Western Cape, is dominated by mixed race people who insist upon calling themselves coloreds and insist upon holding festivals called coon carnivals. And so they are in many ways extremely, almost self-deprecatingly conservative. As a result, they have voted, these non-white people, have voted consistently for white-dominated political parties to run Cape Town and environs since democracy. And it's a massive thorn in the side of the Bantu people of South Africa. It's horrific 
that these mixed race people, and not only mixed race people, some of them are pure blood Aboriginals, sand people and Khoi people. Some of them are Malay people. In other words, they're Muslims who came here as slaves uh, 300 years ago. But these brown people, for want of a better term, of the Cape region vote for these white governments. Um, and it's the only part of South Africa that's dominated by these, this particular white political party. And they, too, have done nothing really to prepare well in advance of this crisis. So there is a degree of finger pointing. But by and large, in a nutshell, for 16 years, the government made no provision. As the countdown happened over the past few years, they did, you could say, even less. So this is not a bolt out of the blue. This is like watching the glaciers get an inch closer every year and refusing to move because somehow magic is going to occur and they won't overrun your cave. So, Schadenfreude. Uh, well, and of course, it also has a lot to do with driving uh, whites out of positions of engineering and driving whites out of positions of city management and so on. Uh, the IQ disparities that I've talked about in this uh, show many times uh, show up in this kind of way where you say, well, you're only 8% of the population, so you can only be 8% of the jobs. And of course, they don't. Mm give the best jobs. And so uh, as the more competent people are driven out of uh, management mm. of these crucial infrastructure resources, of course, they're going to decay. But it's kind of slow. It's kind of like mm. a camera going out of focus really, really slowly. And it has taken decades yeah. for the momentum uh, when whites were in charge to kind of degrade to this uh, degree to the point now where, you know, blaming whites for uh, what happened decades ago is becoming increasingly unbelievable to all but the most ideological. Yes, yeah, you're, you're absolutely correct. It's probably also deliberate to some extent. You know, if you can show that your enemy, or if you can put your enemy society in a crisis and kind of stand back and say, well, it wasn't us and it was them. You know, the, 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 it's very much, there's a degree of schadenfreude, you know, joy in somebody else's destruction, um, uh, Stefan. I think that it is almost a Marxist tactic. Let's see what will happen if we do nothing about the water in the Western Cape. Maybe there'll be a big crisis and we can stand and watch them, you know, crumble. It's a big problem. And, and interestingly, uh, Stefan, what is not being reported in the global media um, is that there is another large city called Port Elizabeth, about uh, probably 800 miles eastwards of Cape Town, also on the coast. And that entire catchment zone is has been, let me put it this way, Cape Town has recently had water restrictions placed upon people 50 liters per day. Now, in the region that I'm talking to you about, my parents live there, 800 miles eastwards. They have had informal water restrictions, not formal, so it's not a, a direct comparison, but informal water restrictions of 50 liters a day since July, if I'm not mistaken, last year. So they've been on the teetering edge of this thing almost as long as there, and there's a possibility that the second massive city in South Africa, one of our leading five cities, is going to go into a day zero situation simultaneous to or not long after Cape Town. Well, this is another potential flashpoint. This is a, a standard Marxist or totalitarian methodology to provoke civil violence. And there is something about the left. They just, they bathe in blood in their mind's eye on a perpetual basis. They love uh, mm. violence uh, more than just about mm. anything else. And what you do, of course, as you know, Simon, is you provoke a crisis and then you point at a scapegoat. And then you just mm. let the mob do its horrible deed. And then you say, well, yes. you know, the system didn't work. It's understandable mm. frustration from the masses. Uh, and uh, then you just right. stand back and you allow the mass to act out the bloody will of the leaders yes. uh, while you pretend to try and keep order. It, it is a standard uh, tactic that has been used French Revolution onwards. Yes, yes, absolutely true. And we see a lot of that in South Africa. And it's difficult to discuss it with all due respect and, you know, and not to play the sycophant to you, uh, Stefan, but the average people that interview us, for example, even the average well-informed right-wing or conservative Christian journalist just doesn't comprehend this stuff. But we are in a situation of Marxism realized, Marxism made manifest. These tactics out of the, te uh, out of the textbook are being applied to us on a daily basis, and they have been uh, under the of international media. In other words, the practices 
happening at Marxist level, but the theory of natural was egregious. Um, has been practiced since the 19, the late 1970s. You know, the Marxists do th certain things in a certain way. They plant a bomb, blow up people on the street in Pretoria, and then the global media steps in as uh, the fourth estate. The fourth estate. Who more noble and independent could there be in the world to say, well, you know, it's because you're absolutely 100% correct. That is precisely what's happening in South Africa now. Well, the media as a whole does not want to reveal to white people what it's like to become a minority, what it's like to be a despised and hated uh, minority, because the left is relying upon importing third world people to vote for themselves. And so they don't want uh, whites to be goosed yes. by the potential outcome of becoming a minority in the country that your ancestors built. And so, of course, they're going to try and suppress this information yes. uh, with the hopes of uh, keeping uh, people dissociated from the outcome of demographic policies that have a very clear uh, outcome, as we can see. Now, let's talk a little bit about your organization, the Suitlanders. Uh, that's S-U-I-D-L-A-N-D-E-R-S dot org. Uh, for people who are watching this, who are in South Africa, for people around the world, we all want to avoid what seems to be coming. If, if, if anything can be done, and as yet, it remains a war of words to a large degree. So what is it that people mm. can do around the world? What is it that people can do to try to avert, or if the aversion fails, to truly prepare? I think that it is difficult to avert, Stefan. I believe that the Northern Hemisphere is much like the camper in the sleeping bag, who has been joined recently by an African python. That python climbs in and slithers so soothingly, silky, silkily over the, the camper's skin. And it only clamps fast once it's wrapped entirely around. Mm. And this consciousness, this awareness that you and other people have of the overt onslaught upon um, Western European derived value systems in particularly the Northern Hemisphere, New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, is too late with respect. Um, yes, you know that the Python is wrapped around you and by definition, it's too late. If they needed more time, they would have taken more time. The reason that they've raised their heads above the parapet uh, in an overt fashion against our culture and our society worldwide is because they, fear they, have, they, they feel they have nothing left to fear. I'm sorry that I can't say something more optimistic, but that's the general consensus of opinion amongst us. Um, the best thing that people can do to prepare is to adopt practices of communities based upon high trust. Um, not even societies, but communities. There is no other way there's just no other way to look after your interests while being a, an almost an, an island in the sea of humanity uh, in the Northern Hemisphere today. You're not going to get it right. You're only going to get it right in groups of 5, 10, 15, 20, and so on. I think that another key thing, another key piece of advice is for people to understand that unless they act in concert, they will get nothing done. In other words, let's say, for example, the man in the corner shop sells pornographic magazines and you're dead against it with your conservative values. Until you stop buying bananas at the corner shop on your way to work, you will achieve nothing. But the day that you and the people who support you in your high trust community stop uh, supporting that corner shop owner, you will begin to see changes. And it really, really works like that. I told you about the boycott of the Spur restaurant chain in South Africa. It took people up to the point that they were incensed, incandescent with rage over political correctness before they would lift a finger. The moment they lifted a finger in unison, boom, the potato price drops through the floor. I've, I've got a, a bag of potatoes over my shoulder for which I paid less than I paid for potatoes four years ago. So, um, but it's difficult to persuade people to do this stuff. They don't believe you. They don't trust you. It's only when it's very, very late in the day that they begin to cling to one another um, in desperation. 
uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry I couldn't say something more positive and optimistic and encouraging, but this is a very, very difficult situation that you guys find yourselves in. And we know, because we've been through it, we're 40 years ahead of you. We know exactly how this movie plays out. Well, of course, uh, as uh, the man on the ground, your empirical experience certainly trumps any words that I will say. And I, I of course, as a word Smith, Smith myself, as a persuader, as a debater, it is always my hope that the pen can be mightier than the sword. But uh, if what you see on the ground is what you see, then it could be that the time for arguments uh, and debates is past which um, is tragic, of course, for South Africa, but can give some potential for the rest of the Western world to see what could come and to provide moral aid where at all possible. So I really do appreciate your time today. Uh, I do want to stay in touch and please keep us abreast of what is happening. I just wanted to remind people, twitter.com forward slash Soitlanders, that's S-U-I-D-L-A-N-D-E-R-S, Soitlanders.org and the organization is Soitlanders of South Africa. Simon, thank you so much for your time today and stay safe, my friend. Thank you very much, Stefan. God bless.